Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Friends, welcome this morning to First Presbyterian Church of Greenwood. Um, it's just me, Steve, and Tim here this morning kind of running things. Uh, Vince is out, um, Elise is out, Kyle's out, so we're going to try and hold things together as best as we can. We're not exactly professionals. Um, but uh, just one brief announcement is that our diaconate is meeting tonight, so if you have anything urgent that the deacons need to know, contact yours so that it can be discussed. Other than that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Skinner here for a brief announcement. What kind of music do you like? Classical? Dixieland? Jazz? All of the above? Cody Beard is going to be here this afternoon at 4 for Festiva, and you're going to get a whole gamut of musical styles from Cody. Uh, he has a new toy, and his public initial uh, commencement of using that is going to be today at 4. You won't want to miss it. I was talking with somebody uh, from First Baptist last week, and they had looked at our festiva and said, oh, you're stealing Cody from us. I said, no, 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 no. We stole him first. <laughs> Let us now uh, turn our hearts to the Lord in preparation for worship. If you may, you can turn to hymn number 643 to follow along and let the words there be a meditation for you. Hungering and thirsting, we come to the Lord. Feed us with your love and healing power, O Lord. Praise be to you, O Lord, for your compassion for us. Praise be to you, O Lord, for your steadfast love.
be seated. God is good and draws near to us. Let us draw near to him in our prayer of confession. Graceful God, you have, you have called, called us to a spirit of unity and peace, and that yet your church is divided over how to best worship and serve you. We confess vanity and thinking the way we worship here is the right way. Help us overcome the differences in thinking and worshiping that we have with our Christian brothers and sisters who are not Presbyterian. Let us fix our eyes on the cross and remain steadfast as we wait for the day of your return. May we all be united as your church. Amen. Friends in Christ, God is good, and because he loves us so much, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. church now. I'd like to invite all of our little ones to come forward for a message with Miss Carter. today. Well, one person's doing good. That's great. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's ask, how are you all doing today? Oh, much better response. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to show you guys some pictures and I think these are going to be familiar to you. So tell me what you see. Stop. stop. When do you see this? Where do you normally see a stop sign? Everywhere on the road. Yeah, stop. Yeah, that tells you to stop. Let's see if you know this one. This always scares me. Oh, deer crossing. What does that mean when you see that? 
Yeah, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? But that's scary when you're driving, right? So this sign helps you know that, uh-oh, I gotta really, really look and follow and watch because a cute little Bambi deer could be running across the road. All right, what is this one? Yeah, a traffic light. When you see the red, it tells you to stop. stop. And what does the green mean? Slow down. Oh, close. <laughs> Okay, the yellow, we're, they were going in order, it was, a, it was a trick question. Okay, so yellow means to slow down. Do your parents slow down when the light turns yellow? Hopefully, okay? That's a good answer. And the green means what? Go. So when we see this on the road, it tells us what to do, right? And we've really got to pay attention to that. Okay, here's one. This one might be a little bit tricky. Do you know this one? Right, there's a curve coming. What do you think that three five, that 35 means? Okay, it could be, oh, this person is way beyond what I was thinking. He said 35 degree turn. Well, yeah, it could be. It could be. I think the 35 means you're supposed to only go about 35 miles an hour around the curve. Let me show this to your family because they probably don't realize that. Have you ever been in the car with your family and they're, you're like, woo, woo, going in the back seat? Happens all the time. Now this last one, you all should know because we're all back in, yeah, what's that bottom word say? School, right? So when we see this, it tells us that there are kids coming to school, right? We're near the school. Well, today in our story that um, Reverend G's going to talk about, Jesus is talking to some people, and they're very confused about what Jesus wants them to do. He's giving them a message of hope, and he's talking about, follow me, and you will have eternal life, because I am the bread of life. But people were very confused by that. They didn't understand what Jesus meant. So, in the story today, he tries to help them understand that following Jesus gets us to heaven, right? I want you to turn around behind you, and I want you to look at the most important sign in our church. What do you see back there, that big gold cross? That's our sign for life. Like we have signs on the road that tell us how to drive and be safe, the cross is our sign to follow Jesus. And every one of us have a chance to follow Jesus and to follow him to heaven. And the cross is our sign for church to remind us of that. Okay? So will you bow your heads with me and let's say your prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving us road signs to keep us safe. But more than anything, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross that reminds us this is how we get to heaven. Amen. You guys have a wonderful day this week at school. Amen. And this time, I'd like for us to turn to the Lord and reflect on his goodness, his graciousness, and to think of something that we can offer him of value in this time of offering.
us pray. Heavenly Father, you have showered us with your many gifts like manna from heaven. Lord, consecrate this offering that we have placed before your throne and let it grow into something special for your kingdom, for your glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning we're going to do things a little bit differently. Um, our scripture reading is going to be very long and I'm going to be preaching and hopefully having a Bible study through it. Um, and to do that, I wanted you all to grab your pew Bibles and, and open them up um, if, if you are so willing. Now most of you um, are going to turn to page 98 in the New Testament, but some select few of you are going to turn to page 92. And that's because although we all have the new Revised Standard Version out there, same kind of print edition, there's a, one of them's a different kind of version, and it's just a few pages off. I think the people in the back row, you're the special lucky ones today. So, um, now, uh, the, the reason for this is that um, um, you, you may want to grab a piece of paper, um, and kind of follow along as I'm going to be reading through the scripture because I'm, I'm going to be pausing a lot, taking some breaks to kind of reflect on what has just been read. And I know that that can sometimes be a little disorienting, you know, doing this. And, um, but that just means I'll, I'll be thinking, you know, you're saying, yes, pastor, amen, um, as you're, you know, reading the, the Bible and looking back up here. Um, but I just want to give you a heads up. Um, so let's now come before the Father in prayer. Lord God, your words that once came in the form of prophets speaking verbally through your servant Moses in the Old Testament became flesh in the person of Jesus. Lord, the word of God that you have given us is like a double-edged sword. It cuts to the heart of the matter, and to our own hearts. Lord, help us this morning. May we wrestle with your word as your servant Jacob wrestled with you, and in so doing, be transformed into somebody new. In your name we pray, amen. From John chapter 6, Verse 22 to 71, New Revised Standard Version. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. But some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So we begin here with a day after Jesus fed the 5,000. And one might expect after a grand miracle like that, that some people would be very interested in what Jesus was going to do next and what he was going to say next. And so, of course, a crowd is going to follow him. They want in on the action. But in verse 26, Jesus is rebuking the people who are just in it literally for a free lunch. He's challenging their spiritual appetite for discipleship. And in fact, this is going to be one of the primary themes in this passage is our spiritual appetite and how it is satisfied. And so, let's, picking back up with, with verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. 
for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Okay, so do not work for perishing food, but do work for food that endures for eternal life. And we'll come back to that in a second. But something else that I wanted to touch on was, you know, Jesus was saying, he identified himself as the Son of Man. And this is a phrase that, that shows up a lot in the New Testament. Jesus says, oh, I'm the Son of Man. You'll, you'll see me coming in on the clouds. And this is coming in from Daniel chapter 7. And let, let me read just a couple verses here. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So whenever Jesus is referring to himself as the Son of Man, he's identifying himself as this same figure and that the prophet Daniel is identifying here. Jesus is basically saying that he is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He has come from the presence of God and that he's been given all this authority. That's a very radical and powerful claim to make. Um, but people don't really pick up on it. They, they pick up on something else. They, say, they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God, they ask. Now these people, they were still operating under the old covenant of this, this idea that you know, God blessed you if you did good and cursed you if you did bad. It was a very kind of performance, transactional kind of a model. And so they're just thinking, okay, Jesus, um, what's the work? And so Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. That's it. Just believe. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now this is interesting because Jesus is saying, okay guys, all the work you need to do is just believe in me. That's it, that's the work, just believe. And here, these guys are trying to play the reverse card on Jesus by making him do the work. As though to compel the, their own belief with, a, with another big miracle. And for me, the, this, this little interaction here says a lot about what these people really want out of their relationship with Jesus. They just want to be spoon-fed they want to sit back. And, you know, I see a lot of skeptics of Christianity kind of make this same move. They, they say, you know, if God exists, then why doesn't he make his existence more obvious to us? And that's a very similar question to, okay, what works are you going to do, Jesus, to make me believe? How are you going to help me out, God? Now, Jesus' response, this is... Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In short, the work that God did back then and still now to help our unbelief was by sending Jesus to the world. That's the work that God did. That's how God has made his existence more obvious to us. It's through the person of Jesus. A person who has changed the world. There is none more famous or greater than him. He is the word made flesh, as John 1.14 says. And the thing is, Jesus is trying to communicate that, that he's been sent down. He echoes 
Deuteronomy 8, chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. Um, this is also something that he says to the devil in the wilderness. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which did not know, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus is the word that has proceeded from the mouth of the Lord. The word that has come into this world to give it light and life. But they're not, they're not picking up on this. These guys, they, they, they said, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hungry, will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the first I am statement in the Gospel of John. The other six being I am the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the vine. And so when you put that one I am statement in verse 35 in a sequence of all the other six, seven total, it's clear to me that Jesus is kind of speaking metaphorically here. He's, He's not literally saying he is a door, like with a door handle, or that he's a vine, like some plant with, you know, with leaves and that kind of stuff. He's, he's kind of speaking to, to illustrate a point, metaphorically, as he often does in parables. And he does that to communicate spiritual truth. And in verse 35, we see the most important spiritual truth being communicated which is that you need to come to Jesus and believe if you want to satisfy the hunger and quench the thirst of your soul. Come and believe. That's all you got to do. That's the work. And there's no bigger decision you can make in this life than that one. Every other decision you make who to work for, how you identify yourself, everything is ultimately secondary to that one. And we'll come back to verse 35 later, but you know, Jesus continues. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything the Father gives me will come to me and anyone who comes to me, I will, not, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, so what is God's will? Well, here it is. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who... See the Son and believe in Him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus is saying that it's God's will for Him to resurrect us through our belief and trust in Him. But the Jews began to complain about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? And you know, you can tell Jesus grew up in a small town because nobody in a big city would say something like that. It's like, oh yeah, he's Mary and Joseph's boy. He ain't nobody special. Yeah, I don't care if he's running for mayor or talks a big game. I went to high school with him, and he's a jerk. You know, this is the sort of grapevine chatter that only exists in a small town, as I'm sure you might know. Um, and Jesus answered them, 
Do not complain amongst yourselves. Or as the King James Version says, murmur not among yourselves. I like that. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. It's Isaiah 54, 13. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. So we just read how important it is to come and believe in Jesus. But here in, in verse 44, it looks like there's another variable. It seems God the Father provides that little nudge. He draws you in and gives you an irresistible offer of grace. This is why in Reformed theology we say that faith is a gift from God, but it's also something that must be worked on. God will make you lie down in green pastures. He'll lead you to still waters. But you're the one who's going to have to drink from them. And picking it back up at, at verse 48, here Jesus says again, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So what Jesus is saying here isn't new information, right? He's, he's kind of repeating himself. He's just saying stuff that, he, that he's been saying earlier in this conversation. But he's being a little bit more direct to kind of make a point. He's building on this illustration that the kind of food that we need to consume isn't the physical kind, isn't stuff that, that's made with physical stuff that satisfies our physical body. Rather, as the living bread, as the living word, Jesus is the food that we need to feast on. And he came down from heaven to do that. And that's why verse 35 was, was, was key to kind of understand, understanding this, this whole conversation. The importance of, of our need to come and believe. That's what it means to, to, to take the bread of life. But the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And you know, at this point, I suspect Jesus might be thinking, you guys just aren't getting it, are you? Of all the things that, that Jesus has said up until this point, of claiming that he has descended from heaven, that he has come to give life to the world, that he's going to offer up his flesh that he will resurrect those who believe in him. These are all big and radical claims. And these people are getting caught up on this one little distracting point right here about eating flesh, which is prohibited in the Torah anyway. They're taking Jesus too literally here. And they've missed everything else he said up until this point. But the weird thing is, Jesus kind of doubles down on, on his position in an unexpected way. See, the first time Jesus said, eat of my bread, the Greek verb there in the manuscripts is estheo, which means to consume, like as you would with food. But in, in the following passage, which we'll read, the Greek verb shifts to trogo, which means to chew on or munch. It's a more vivid word to use. Here at verse 53, so Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat, and that's where the verb shift to trogo happens, those who eat 
munch on, chew my flesh and drink my blood, have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is the true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which the ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in a synagogue at Capernaum. Now you might be thinking, okay, uh, you know, again, Jesus is just reiterating the same point he's been trying to make. Whoever comes to him and believes and abides in him will have eternal life. But why does he have to complicate things for us by switching the verb? In fact, it's precisely this complication that has led to a theological controversy of sorts. It divided Jesus' disciples back then, and it still is divisive today when it comes to the Eucharist and what the Catholics believe about it. And we'll get to that in a second. But the question here for us to consider is, you know, is Jesus speaking literally? Or is he speaking figuratively? Verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? This is a hard saying. It is hard. And it is reasonable to question it. I mean, is Jesus really saying you need to drink my blood like a vampire or eat my flesh like a cannibal? That's weird. This is a, a passage that we just have to wrestle with. And what's interesting is that the, the church fathers kind of stuck to a, a literal or very literal kind of reading of this passage, which is also weird. Like Irenaeus and Polycarp, all those guys. It's like they, they took what Jesus was saying here kind of literally at face value. And that's the position that the Roman Catholic Church has maintained. But to complicate things even further, we get a slightly different account of the Lord's Supper from John than we do in the Gospels. You know, specifically, John doesn't refer or, or cover the details of the institution of the Lord's Supper like the other Gospels do. John focuses on kind of what the Supper was about and kind of what it meant. And so normally in a Bible study, like, like we're doing right now, we, we, we want to go to another passage and say, okay, well, what, what's, the, what's the context here? How can we fit these puzzle pieces together? And this is what scholars and theologians do. They, this is a, a time-honored practice and principle in theology where we just let Scripture interpret Scripture for us. We try not to breathe our own biases and, and views into the Word, but we let the Word kind of tell us what it's saying for itself. And so, you know, scholars kind of use um, this idea uh, what, that I call the proximity principle, which is just a fancy way of saying to examine the context of a verse in the passage that it's sitting in, and then you zoom out, okay, look at the chapter, zoom out again, look at the book, and then zoom out, look at the whole Bible. And you try and find other verses and other passages that help you kind of piece things together and the proximity principle suggests that we should try to stay close to the original passage as best as we can. You know, don't zoom out too far, because then you might see things that aren't really there. But again, you know, the Catholics, you know, when they, when they do their zooming out, when they try and interpret this passage, um, they, they see uh, the Lord's Supper as recorded in the Gospels through the lens of John 6 here. Which is why they believe that when Christ instituted the new covenant and said, take, eat, this is my body, that the bread literally becomes his body, the body of Christ. And just to be clear, because I, I don't want to... Uh, you know, present a, a bad teaching here. This is a, here are a couple articles from 
the Catholic Catechism. Um, this is Article 1376. The Council of Trent summarizes the Catholic faith by declaring, because Christ our Redeemer said that it was truly his, his body that he was offering under the species of bread, it has always been the conviction of the Church of God, and this Holy Council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. Article 1400. Ecclesial communities derived from the Reformation and separated from the Catholic Church, that would be us, have not preserved the proper reality of the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness, especially because of the absence of the sacrament of holy orders. It is for this reason that for the Catholic Church, Eucharistic intercommunion with these communities is not possible. However, these communities, when they commemorate the Lord's death and resurrection in the Holy Supper, do profess that it signifies life in communion with Christ and awaiting his coming in glory. So those of you who grew up Catholic, you probably already knew that. And those of you who have gone to a Catholic church and, you know, the priest says, hey, if you're not Catholic, <clears throat> don't come up here. Um, and that, this is just a theological disagreement that we have with the Catholic Church. It's over this very issue of who has a seat at the Lord's table, who understands it. And while the Catholics affirm that what we believe about the Lord's table is, is good and that it, it does signify life with Christ, they exclude us from that table because we don't buy into this idea of transubstantiation. And this sort of thing happens whenever you come across a difficult passage and try to interpret it the best you can. And you try to really think biblically, biblically and you do the work. But once in a while, you just come to different conclusions. But I think Jesus gave us a clue on how to work our way through this difficult passage. Turning now back to verse 61. But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's kind of ironic because he will ascend later. It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Let me repeat that verse, 63. Highlight it if, if, you, if, you, if you do that. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who were the ones who did not believe and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about him. They had this hard teaching. John chapter 6, verse 66. It's an ominous number there. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back just like the devil did. People walked away from Jesus because they could not accept his teaching. They couldn't get it. They were taking him too literally, and they, they thought that Jesus really was telling them that they had to eat him and drink his blood. Of course they walked away. But like verse 35, verse 63, which you know, I tried to emphasize, really helps us see the broader context here, the meaning of what Jesus is getting at. His words are not to be taken literally. Verse 63 says, his words are spirit and life. They are to be taken as spiritual truth. 
we have to hear Jesus not in a literal way, but a spiritual way. And his apostles, I think, came to that conclusion. Jesus asked, asked them, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. That's the correct answer for this whole difficult passage. Jesus has the words of life. That's the bread. And the work that they're doing is to come and believe that he is the Holy One of God. That was Peter's response and the rest of the 12. That should be our response too. Accept Jesus' words. For they, and this whole passage, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, that's our scripture reading, so let me get to the sermon. Um, <laughs> woo! All right, th th this will be brief. I just have like one page of notes left. Um, so Jesus chose the twelve and gave them an offer they couldn't refuse. And they did their part by coming to him and believing in him. And, and Simon Peter understood that. And I hope you do too. I hope that you see this difficult passage that we disagree with regarding what the Catholic view is as conveying a spiritual truth that the bread of life is not something that magically and mysteriously transforms into the flesh of Christ when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, but rather communion, the Eucharist, is soul food. Um, in, the, in the Scots Confession actually kind of puts it like this. Um, this is Article 5.205 for you catechism nerds out there, um, of which I might be one. Uh, maybe Cliff Kane. Yeah. The presence of Christ in the supper. We do not, therefore, so join the body of the Lord and his blood with the bread and wine as to say that the bread itself is the body of Christ, except in a sacramental way, or that the body of Christ is hidden corporally under the bread, so that it ought to be worshipped under the form of bread, or yet that whoever receives the sign receives also the thing itself. The body of Christ is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and therefore our hearts are to be lifted on high, not to be fixed on the bread. Neither is the Lord to be worshipped in the bread. The Lord is not absent from his church when she celebrates supper. Like the sun, which is absent from us at night, we still feel its effects present among us. How much more so is the Son of Righteousness, Christ, although in body, physically, is absent from us when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, is nonetheless present with us in the vivifying operation of such. So what are we to say about all this? Are the Catholics wrong when it comes to this issue? Yes. But does that make them any less Christian? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. At the end of the day, anybody who comes to Jesus and believes in him is a Christian. That's the most important work. And historically, the church has looked to the Nicene Creed to communicate this, to demarcate the boundary of what is Orthodox belief. And we may disagree with our Catholic and Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters on how to practice our faith, but we all agree on what it is at the end of the day. Truth that is communicated in the Nicene Creed. That's what every church, every denomination and tradition can stand up and believe in if it calls itself Christian. And so now, my, my friends, I want to bid us to rise and stand to confess this historic creed. We believe in 
one God, the Father of my maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father for all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten. be with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go now and partake in the bread of life, who is the Word made flesh, Jesus.
that's like one of the...